How do you do? The rambling director feels it would be a little unkind to present this commentary without a word of friendly warning. We are about to talk about the story of Frankenstein, a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image without reckoning upon God. It is one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of being, life and death. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you don't want to subject yourself to such a commentary, now's your time to, uh, well, I warned you. <laughs> Today we talk about the Carl Limerly and James Whale production of Frankenstein, the classic 1931 universal monster film which has defined an era. As much as I like to think, it, because I do love the movies, that Dracula was the first modern horror film, and I, I would say I believe that, I believe that what it innovated, James Whale's Frankenstein perfected. Of course, James Whale uh, was also the director of The Invisible Man, which is my favorite of the Universal Monster films starring Claude Rains. This one stars Boris Karloff as the monster, <laughs> and uh, Colin Clive as the titular Henry Frankenstein. Now, you may notice, if you're familiar with the book, that in the book, his name was Victor Frankenstein, and he had a friend named Henry, and in the movie, his name is Henry, and he has a friend named Victor. Now, I would argue that this is probably to give audiences sort of a warning that, hey, this is going to be a completely different beast. And in fact, everything from the first scene that we're in, in this graveyard, onward, is pretty much entirely going to be... Uh, things that did not happen in the book. This has next to nothing to do with the book. It merely borrows the themes and characters and some general beats from the story. Right off the bat, we see um, the amazing Dwight Fry, one of the great character actors of all time. Uh, of course, this scene was made fun of in Young Frankenstein, the Mel Brooks comedy, where Fritz stands up and is looking and... Frankenstein says, down, you fool, and he pushes him down and then proceeds to stay up in the same height that Fritz was just at. Fritz is where we get the common idea of a hunchback assistant helping Frankenstein. That actually was not in the book. And in fact, most of us think of Igor, or sorry, <laughs> Igor, my bad. Igor was the character from Young Frankenstein. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> Igor, um, but Igor was actually a different assistant who was not a hunchback, but a man who had a broken neck, which healed funny. So he stands in a funny position, but he's not technically a humpback. And he didn't come in until, I believe, The Son of Frankenstein, which I think was the third sequel in this series. So we kind of combine the characters of Fritz and Igor together in our popular culture. However, contrary to what, is to what has now, because of the internet, become popular belief, Fritz was not the original assistant to Frankenstein. Or I should say Fritz was the original, but he wasn't original to this production. The first ever theatrical production of Frankenstein was done on stage. I think it was done in London. It was the only production that Mary Shelley saw in her lifetime, and she actually wrote about it, making fun of it, because she thought, although certain elements were fine. She particularly liked the guy who played the monster. That overall, she thought the production was very lacking. But that production, funny enough, gave him a quirky sidekick assistant named Fritz. Now, that play was called Presumption, or The Fate of Frankenstein. You can look it up. Um, you can actually read the play online, I believe. It's public domain. And what is fascinating about that is not only did it do that, but that play which would have introduced the masses who might not have read the book to the story, also portrayed the monster as being mentally disturbed and being a mute. Uh, in fact, hearing the music and reacting to it by 
and grasping at the sunlight. Those are all elements this movie does. Oh, hold on. One of the best shots in the movie there. Look at what a great face. Man, he's such a manic actor. I just, ah, I love his, his interpretation of Frankenstein's character. He is without a doubt the, the definitive Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. So as I was saying, presumption is, is actually something that this production borrowed a heck of a lot from. When you get down to it, uh, there is just so much that this borrowed from that play, and that play put into popular culture. So you could argue that perhaps it was really just using elements that had become common misconceptions and making them into a movie. Dwight Fry, um, I think I said in my Dracula video, is one of the great underrated character actors of all time. Uh, some people might say, well, anybody who's familiar with old films doesn't, he doesn't think he's underrated. They appreciate it. Well, yeah, but that, yeah, but in a world where everybody knows who Johnny Depp is, and, you know, the majority of the population probably no longer know who people like Lon Chaney and Lon Chaney Jr. and Dwight Fry and uh, Colin Clive, in a world that doesn't know who those people are anymore, they are underappreciated. So that's all I have to say about that. Uh, you'll notice that the man who came out at the beginning to make the announcement to the audience, was that Ed Edward Van Sloan, who plays Dr. Waldman in this movie, but also played Van Helsing in Dracula, the universal production of Dracula, this same year. And you're about to see him again. Now, as we go into this, I do want to point out, just so you can keep an eye out for it, that Victor Moritz, the, the friend of Frankenstein, seems to be an archetype of the character of Kemp from The Invisible Man. And I think James Whale must have really liked the idea of doing this. And I think maybe he did not like the character of Victor in this production because the character of Kemp is played very much as an, as an over-the-top coward who gets what he deserves in The Invisible Man. So I think he he didn't have a lot of, of, a lot of respect for that character. Now, this is one of the key differences from the book. Fritz going in to find a brain in a laboratory, and instead of getting the good brain, he picks up a dysfunctional brain, an abnormal brain, and that is why the monster turns out to be mentally deficient. I just love the fact that he just leaves the brains in a jar right out in the open. Is these will remain out here for your further inspection, and I'm going to leave the class too. <laughs> just gonna leave them out. What's the worst that could happen to these prized specimens right here? Now you could also make the argument that a preserved brain probably would not be capable of functioning again because of the nature of preserving it. However, I I think it's just one of those things now. We've become uh, almost a culture of people who just love to nitpick and to pick out things. Um, just say, oh, well, well, that didn't happen. Oh, Citizen Kane, greatest movie of all time. Yeah, I don't think so. Nobody was there to hear him say Rosebud. You know, or, or watch Casablanca. Oh, what were they talking about? Well, who were they talking to to present the, the, idea, that these, the, the idea that these top secret letters, that the letters of transit, you know, we we're just going to announce this over a loudspeaker for everybody to hear, even though it's top secret. <laughs> yeah. Oh, such a bad movie. And they're just, you know, they're armchair critics. Um, they're not worth your time uh, because there are certain things. I'll tell you this as a filmmaker. I'm not really a critic. I do criticize movies in the sense that I pick movies I like and tell how they could be better, but I never just pick up a, a movie that I think is bad and, make fun of it because I don't see anything constructive coming out of that. Sure, it might be good for a laugh, but it doesn't ultimately aid in the development of better filmmakers. Now, watch this scene coming up here. We we start this off with four close-ups. And these four close-ups, um, it's kind of a unique way of filming a shot because you normally start with the established shot and move into close-ups. This time, we start with close-ups, so you're kind of you're kind of in the midst of a mystery. What is happening? Who's talking to who? What is going on? And then we cut to a wide shot, and that's when we meet Victor and Elizabeth, the, um, well, the bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> of course, Frankenstein sends this letter saying that he can't, um, 
He can't be with her right now. His work has to come first. This is the sort of magnificent exposition that you only get in old movies because they they just knew how to present this information in a way that you know wasn't boring but didn't seem like you were spoon feeding the audience. Um, I think that's because a lot of film writers, screenwriters, came from uh, the stage. They were playwrights, so they understood how to present the information. Now, you can already tell from his posture and the way he stands beside her that he's... But even before he just says, I'd go to the ends of the earth for you, you can tell he's very into her. That uh, James Will just did not have a lot of sympathy for the sort of man who would just go around and hit on somebody else's partner right you know you know at the worst of times and i think that's why kemp ended up having such an awful fate in the invisible man <laughs> but you can also see a lot of the the same archetypal um layout to the story now dr waldman uh, already is giving us um the central conflict of the film waldman says too much ambition too much science can be dangerous um, whereas Frankenstein is science without limits. Now, of course, this is not a politically correct thing to talk about today in a time when science has almost become a religion. But at this point in time, it was it, it's more really more important than ever that we have this conversation. Um, it's just not something people are willing to have. What is too far? Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should, as, uh, as the Jeff Goldblum character in Jurassic Park would say. You can see... In the way the shots are framed, you know, Waldman in the skull on either side, Elizabeth in the middle, you can just see such such a, a artistry to the way James Whale composed these shots to tell his story. And he lays out uh, a lot of the conflict visually. Death versus life on either side of Elizabeth. Um, the, the skull obviously representing Frankenstein in the scene. The skull is in almost every shot framed like it's a person. It's kind of an interesting stand-in for him. Of course, the fantastic watch tower, watch tower <laughs> and its accompanying set. This is just phenomenal. Look at the verticality in this set. Now, remember, it, I, I criticized Dracula, the original Dracula, for the fact that the shots were so wide. But if you notice, James Whale keeps the shots quite close to the people, but frames it in a way that you can see the height of these sets. I've actually heard people say that the verticality of these sets was designed, and the shots were framed to keep the ceilings in the shots. They were designed that way, specifically with the intent of building to the moment where the creature is grabbing at the sunlight for the first time. Which I think, by the way, is one of the greatest um, scenes ever put to film. Just my opinion, but that's how I feel. I, I've always thought it's just one of the great scenes of cinema. Of course, we keep a lot of the same actors from Dracula. I think I pointed that out. Um, Edward Von Sloan, Dwight Fry, uh, and uh, that's not really to be surprised. Uh, because we see... Uh, sorry, I get distracted by his monologue. Just beautiful. No blood. Uh, that's not uncommon, and especially as you get further along, you can see the same happen with the Hammer Horror movies. I've always really admired this, and maybe I'll do a separate video on this entirely. Frankenstein has a real obsession with his hands. And I think it's meant to be sort of symbolic of the fact that he wants to be God. So what do they always say? What do you say in prayers a lot of the time? You say, Lord, keep us in your hands. The handmaid of God. The, um, I think a couple times in the Psalms, I think it is, that it says that Adam was made by God's own hands. You know, I think that is the idea that he he wants to... Uh, even, even in the famous Michelangelo painting on the Sistine Chapel, God giving power to Adam, what is he... How is he doing that? He's endowing him with power through his hand. I think that is... That is j just a little tiny bit of... A, a very subtle symbolism of what he's looking to accomplish. 
And I've always just found that fascinating, especially the fact that Colin Clive is... He presents it in such a manic way, but in such a relatable way. With these hands. You know, oh. It, it's just grand. Of course, Fritz answers the door, but he won't let anybody in. Now, watch this. As he goes up the stairs, it's so unique. He stops on the stairs and fixes his sock. There, there's no reason, like, there's no reason to say that's, like, a flaw. You know, it's not, um... This is not a, a plow hole or anything. It's nothing bad. It's just so strange because you never see characters do things like that. So I've always found that interesting. This is one of my favorite shots right here, looking up on the window as Frankenstein looks down upon them. And of course, he looks down as we hear Elizabeth's voice. And I think that is the thing that turns his mind and makes him say, oh, I gotta let, let him in. I can't leave Elizabeth out there. Because he does, despite his flaws, love Elizabeth. Colin Clive has just one of these most, the most unique voices in cinematic history, I think. I don't know if you caught that, but that's one of the dumber lines you'll ever hear in a movie. What's all this nonsense with locked doors? I mean, does, does he not understand that this was the front door to a domicile? <laughs> I mean, like, you're not going to tell me that this guy doesn't understand that when you're undertaking a secret scientific experiment, you don't want to have random members of the public walking in and getting hurt, right? There. Of course, Victor makes everything worse. <laughs> and this grand, grand close-up on him. Crazy, am I? Uh, you can also see a lot of the archetypal mad scientist that was created in this. Every mad scientist after this has taken elements from Colin Clive's performance, including, by the way, um, Claude Rains in The Invisible Man, where we have the same thing. In fact, it's the same line, I believe. He says, crazy, am I? And then uh, The Invisible Man, I believe Jack Griffin actually says, crazy? You think I'm crazy? You know, he's, uh, it's, it's a very similar line. And, of course, the main difference, I mean, even down to their, their voices are very similar. You can just tell that James Whale had an affinity for this type of acting. I've also often said myself that James Whale, since James Whale was gay, uh, by the way, in case you don't know that, and I've always thought it was, thought it was cute that he typically casts very good-looking guys in his movies and has them behave in a sort of flamboyant way. See, even there, he tells Victor, sit down, sit down. I believe the Invisible Man does the same thing right when he grabs a fire poker. He goes, sit down, Kemp. Sit down or I'll bash your brains in or something like that. <laughs> the, the scientific laboratory is just, this is truly the grandfather of all labs. And I know any commentary will say that, but it really bears repeating. Every mad scientist laboratory has almost exclusively taken clues, uh, cues rather, from this film. Notice that we frame the shot, student towering over teacher. Here it is. I created it. I made it with my own hands. I often think of uh, Ren and Stimpy, <laughs> that episode where Ren is, is going to, uh, he's going to strangle Stimpy in his sleep and he has this moment where, like, he keeps talking about, with these hands. That's, <laughs> that's always what I think about. <laughs> this is brilliant, actually, because it actually sets up that, really, realistically, Frankenstein should have some spectators, some witnesses to see this scene. Of course, everybody looks at him like, you know, they're looking at a man who has completely lost his marbles. Which, of course, to some degree, is correct. Frankenstein has kind of lost it a little bit. Even though he is right, he has also kind of lost it. Now, if you notice, as they uncover him, they specifically hide the monster's face. And that's important. They do that for a good cinematic reason. They are trying to hide his face for as long as possible to build up the suspense of what the monster looks like. And his final reveal is one of the best reveals ever. They hide his face, and in fact, you don't even see the monster get up off the slab in this one, which 
is quite unique in terms of Frankenstein movies. It's not something you see. Most Frankenstein movies are not that reserved. And of course you have um, films like the Kenneth Branagh, uh, Mary Shelley Frankenstein, which the creation scene is so incredibly over the top that it, it, it goes, it kind of transcends from being epic to being laughable to being epic again. It goes clear on the other side of over the top that it's so over the top, it's amazing. But this one's a little bit more subtle by focusing mainly on the instruments. Now, of course, a lot of people have pointed out that the use of lightning was never, in electrodes and all that stuff, was never even really hinted at in the Mary Shelley novel. Of course, we're coming up on one of the most famous lines, if not the most famous line in cinematic history. The most quoted line, certainly. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Oh, in the name of God. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, I know what it feels like to be God. Now that is uh, actually was such a controversial line that it was censored. Now, depending on which version you saw, the censored version was either a jump cut where they just cut out the line or... Um, many versions actually had the the thunder grow so loud you couldn't hear what he was saying. But I think that important important line is the is the most important line in the movie. In the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. And he's actually so excited that he has to be restrained. Uh, Colin Clive is almost almost spasming. Uh, you know he's he's jerking sporadically. It's almost like he's having a seizure when he says it. He's so drunk with the power that's what he wanted was to have the power to be god and it's you know it's sort of a classic mad scientist cliche now that scientists want to play god and that was a, a crucially important part of this uh a crucially par important part of this story, and I was thought it was strange that they would edit it out for being blasphemous, when that is kind of the point. He is, by his actions, blaspheming, and by the end, he ultimately learns the lesson that there are things that science need not dabble in, because it's just not going to cause anybody anything but trouble. The Invisible Man, he actually did the same thing. At the end, he tells Flora, Flora, dear, I messed in things that man has no right to. And so this is clearly a common theme that James Whale must have had a fascination with because he agreed to do two movies, the two movies in the Universal Catalog that are arguably the most similar. Now, I'm talking over a lot of this scene because although Frederick Kerr is a very good actor, the scenes with Baron Frankenstein, Henry's father, are quite honestly the worst part of the film. I just have nothing to say about him. Um, his father is pretty insufferable. And, uh, yeah, to that end, I just don't like these scenes very much. You might think, well, the Baron is on the right side in this. And I would agree. He's saying, no, it's not fair for him to leave Elizabeth alone. I think he's seeing somebody else and we're going to stop this. That He's not going to disrespect our family like this and disrespect Elizabeth like that. I totally get that. But I also have to say, they just could have played him as a better character, a character who's more relatable, um, because he has the most relatable, <laughs> the most relatable motivation of any of the side characters. I do think that it's intriguing uh, to note that that speech he gave about people thinking you're crazy was not in the shooting script. And so speculation for a long time has been that James Whale might have wrote that speech and put it into the film. And I, I have to agree. I think that probably did happen because it's one of those things where if you take it out of a scientific context and put it into an artistic context, I could see a director feeling that way. It's always something that's spoken to me personally is 
artistically to discover something something that is just incredibly important to the artistic realm. For instance, philosophically, what is eternity? How do you present that? How do you talk about it? Well, people might think you're crazy, but if you couldn't come to some understanding of it, isn't it worth being called crazy? If you can come to some understanding of a part of the mystery of life, because that's what we present as filmmakers, is the mystery of life. Here's the reveal. He walks backwards into the room. I think this was to avoid seeing light. I think that was the idea, because he's afraid of the light. But look at this. Oh, he turns around. Magnificent. If you notice, there's a kind of a sunken in part of his cheek on the side of uh, Boris Karloff's face. Some people think that's makeup. Actually, it turns out he had a partial, uh, you know, te for his teeth. He had a partial, and he would take it out when he would play this role, and he would suck his cheek in through the hole between his teeth, and that is what created that effect. I don't think that any of the other actors, um, Strange, Lugosi, and any of the people who played Frankenstein's creature in any of the, the preceding films... I don't think any of them looked as good as Boris Karloff in this film. And I think he looked so good because the makeup was made for his face. Apparently, when James Whale saw Boris Karloff for the first time, he asked him to come over and have dinner with him. And he told Karloff to his face, your face has startling possibilities. I just love that. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Here we see the Frankenstein monster seeing light sunlight for the first time and i said before i think this might be one of the most beautiful moments ever put to cinema i mean just watch how subtly and beautifully karloff plays this scene it is just without doubt one of the most balletic almost operatic moments in cinema and they don't cheapen it with music they let it play they let it just have its moment and you can see the tears in his eyes the 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 desire in his face uh, Bela Lugosi actually was originally uh, considered after the success of Dracula to play the creature and he refused according to legend, it's for two reasons. Uh, nobody knows the exact reason. There's no record. But according to the word of mouth, he either refused it because he didn't want to have his face made unrecognizable by the makeup when he had just made a name for himself as Dracula. And the other reason was because apparently he said that the Frankenstein monster would not take any talent to play. And look at that face. You cannot tell me that Boris Karloff, through mountains of makeup with just his hands and his eyes, can make you feel so desperately sorry for a character, make you instantly feel the sort of sympathy you feel when you see a mentally retarded person. Um, it's just beautiful. Now, here comes a, scene, a sequence that we're seeing right now where Fritz, for some reason, takes an extreme hatred to the monster. And pretty much every time the monster freaks out from this point on, you can almost exclusively blame on Fritz. I don't know why Fritz has such a hatred for this thing. Um, in terms of the movie, I don't know why. I've always thought it was a little bit strange that he just he helped Frankenstein create the monster, and here he is again torturing him. Uh, this actually, this scene with the whip was cut out upon original release because it was so horrific that, uh, that nobody, no, nobody thought it would, it would, be, it would be able to be taken by the women in the audience. And they might be right. And Frankenstein becomes a much more sympathetic character at this point because he just wants people to stop torturing this poor thing you know it's so sad and even you can even hear it in his voice when he says just leave it alone fritz just leave it alone and he sounds so desperate uh, oh there he is fritz has been hung oh man <laughs> <It's> so harsh <laughs> but you know he deserved it now i think 
that maybe what James Whale, again, being a gay person at a time when it was very heavily persecuted to be gay, I wonder if he wasn't kind of implying that Fritz, played by Dwight Fry, who is a very flamboyant person in everything he's in, I wondered if maybe he wasn't playing that off as if Fritz was in love with Frankenstein. I mean, we'd never see him get paid, you know? We never hear that he's a paid assistant. So, and he's doing all this crazy stuff that no normal person would do for him. And so I have to wonder if maybe he was in love with Frankenstein and he grew jealous of the monster getting more attention than he did. Um, of course, agree, disagree, that's fine. Um, but, you know, do let me know why you disagree or why you agree with that. Um, it's something that's always, I've always thought, uh, that it really made a, a lot of sense to me that that might be the reason why. And it would be James Whale's little, very subtle way of getting in a, a gay character. Um, Dr. Pretorius, of course, in The Bride of Frankenstein, has often been called an openly gay character because he uh, he actually acts and and makes certain comments that make you think he might be gay. And I just think it's kind of cool to think that James Whale was able to get by with that. And, uh, you know, he wasn't afraid to make them the most interesting character in the movie, uh, whether or not it would have been something that was well accepted or whether or not that meant making them the villain. Now, that shot, that close up of Waldman uh, sticking the hypodermic needle into the monster was cut out on first release. Again, um... There were several things that were cut out of this movie uh, before it was released. Strange, because this was before the Hayes censorship code passed. And so the censorship would have been self-imposed based on test screening. And of course, Victor shows up <laughs> way too late. Uh, of course, the Baron Frankenstein is coming to visit, and he just happens to be coming at the worst possible time, because parents in movies can never come to visit you at a good time, can they? Whenever a parent comes to visit, no matter how serious the movie is, it, it immediately becomes my big fat Greek wedding. <laughs> Look at that shot. Look at that scene. The light, the shafts of light pouring in through the window. The angles of the sets. The shadows in certain places look painted onto the floor. That's clearly German expressionistic influence. I just do not find his character very interesting at all. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> and look at the torches still laying on the ground. If you notice, I think it happens twice in this movie that there are points where um, Frankenstein actually lands on a torch. And I think it happens again um, to... Uh, one of Dwight Fry's characters at some point, but I can't remember which movie it's in. Um, it's amazing how little fire safety they had in these old movies. Yeah. He's just so rude. I, I think that might be why I, I dislike him so much, is that he's just so rude. And his scenes are pretty much, with the exception of this scene, pretty much useless. Even then... You could have had Waldman, Victor, and Elizabeth see Henry collapse, and then they make the decision to bring him home. The father character could have been cut out through just some careful rearranging of some lines. See, even walking up the stairs, he can't help himself but complain all the time. Because they come in, and Henry collapses, and that's when they know. And Henry, I think, himself has kind of come to the conclusion that actually, no, this is... This is a bad idea. I, this, there's, this is just too much. I, we can't live like this, you know? Now, this has always bothered me to a degree that um, they pretty much take, remove him forcibly. Um, and, and I always thought that was a little bit strange because, I mean, really, um, although what he's doing is not necessarily moral, they see his experiments are successful. And you just never get the vibe that Va Dr. Waldman really would preserve the records of his experiments. There's, you know, there's just something that makes me think he's probably not going to not gonna do that. Because he, he already thought it was a sin against God to be doing this. 
And I just don't feel like he was probably being genuine in that way. However, he does say he's going to painlessly destroy the monster. So he's injected him. He's uh, trying to keep him sedated. And uh, we see him getting ready to start the process of taking the monster apart. And I always thought <laughs> it was kind of funny to me that Boris Karloff's chest is... Uh, you know, he's, he was quite a gaunt man, but they build him up so much in those clothes that when the clothes are removed and you see his chest in relationship to his massive makeup-covered head, uh, he looks kind of disproportional. And it always made me feel like there was something of an uncanny vibe to this scene because of that. Oh, and here he goes. Oh, no. He's gonna get him. I guess he's got him now. <laughs> There's no gonna anymore. It's happening. <laughs> I always love the fact that these moments of horror are very underplayed in, in these films by not having huge dramatic music. And they cut away early. They don't feel the need to show blood and guts and gore. Now, if that, if that happened in a modern movie, he'd, I don't know, reach up under his rib cage and rip his still beating heart out as gallons of blood gushed all over the floor. But I just think there's something classy about him just strangling him to death, and we don't even see it, we don't even see it end, you know, we don't even get to the end of it. I think that's, I think that's better. Uh, this has nothing to do with the film, but really skinny dogs, like uh, sight hounds of any kind, greyhounds, etc., they, they've always scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> you see Henry... Almost like a recovering addict. You know? He seems like somebody who needs something. Needs something to occupy his mind. Almost Holmesian in that way. I do think the moments with him and Elizabeth are very sweet. There's just a... There's a bit, bit too few of them. I've always thought that was... Kind of cool when families do stuff like that. Actually, actually, funny enough, since I mentioned it earlier, uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, one of the moments that always makes me cry in that movie is um, when the grandmother brings in the flower crown that has that she wore at her wedding for Tula to wear. I think stuff like that's really neat. Um, little scenes like this, um, they actually do add a lot to the film by just having the world live and breathe. Like... There was a lot of history before this movie started, and the world will continue to exist years into the future. I think that's part of why the sequels work so well, is because the world is so fully alive. And now, of course, we had so much horror. Uh, this was pretty traditional for a lot of their, univer for the Universal monster movies, that we have moments that are little breaks from the horror, where we just have nice, you know, moments, some songs, some dance. Some happy people talking about happy things, even if it doesn't necessarily relate to the plot really that much. Beautiful sets. I don't know if I mentioned that before beyond the fact that there's a tremendous verticality to them. Beautiful sets. The exteriors are all a set on the back lot of Universal. And of course, this gorgeous living room with the molded woodwork. You know, it just looks so real, so lived in. It looks like people actually inhabit that space on a daily basis. This town looks like a real town. It doesn't look too clean. There's a grungy element to it. And I believe that this town set was reused for uh, a lot of these scenes in The uh, the Wolfman, I believe. I, I might be wrong about that. Um, I'll double check that. But I do believe that, that these were reused for The Wolfman and a couple other Universal monster movies. Uh, but they were reused throughout uh, Universal history, and I believe they were eventually, finally put to rest when when uh, they were tearing down the sets in the 1970s. Actually, a movie was filmed around that event, which was, uh, I think it was called The Phantom of Hollywood, loosely based on The Phantom of the Opera, and it films a lot of the destruction of those sets, and I think they were trying to, to make a good movie around the wanton destruction they were committing. But in the end, it just comes off like Universal destroyed some of the most iconic sets of all time just to make a buck. And that is pretty sad. <laughs> Not gonna lie. It, 
it's a it's it's a film that every time I see somebody talk about it, which isn't often because most people don't even know that film exists, it kind of makes me sad inside. Now we're coming to one of the most iconic scenes in all of monster movie history, a scene that was so bad um, that it had to be cut from the film and was only restored on home video releases, and which uh, which happened in the eighties and nineties, I believe. Of course just a sweet little girl. She doesn't know any better, you know? And she's so innocent that she thinks he'll just play with her. And of course he does. There's something tremendously sweet about the monster. Um, And I think it's the reason why we both feel sorry for him, despite the fact that he's so big and so powerful and, and um, so destructive that we are scared of him. We're also feel very sad for him as well. You see, she throws the flowers in the water and that shows to him, oh, you know, somebody who's never seen water really before in this context, he's like, oh, you throw things in the water, it floats, right? It's the sort of simple-minded thing that somebody of his, of his brain capacity would think. And then he just throws her in the water. And of course she can't swim and she doesn't float like a flower. So she drowns and the monster realizing that she sunk is scared. And like a child, rather than helping, he runs away. Now I do want to remind you that scene was cut. The reason that I want you to keep that in mind is because as we go into the, the next part, when her father finds her dead body, I want you to think about the implication. Okay? Just think about the implication with that scene cutting before he throws her in the water. Where he just moves towards her and it cuts away. Okay? So just keep that in mind as we go forward. And we get some fantastic uh, dance and song sequences here. This is the sort of fun uh, thing that that movies did for a long time where there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of spectacle to it. The only modern movie I've seen that does this really is the, um, Robert Zemeckis Christmas Carol movie where, you know, there's a big dance number in fezzy wigs, but even then it's still a little too related to the plot. You know, there's, there's a little bit too much connection. Um, but that, that's going in the right direction. I think, that this is the sort of thing that we need to get back to a little bit more. You know, movies were a spectacle. They were fun. They were something you went and, and, you know, it was entertainment for you. You have two jobs as a filmmaker. The first is to entertain. If you do that, you've given 100%. Anything else, you know, intriguing thoughts, twists, extra story beats and stuff, you know, Chris Nolan monologues, all of that is extra. That's the extra 10 to your 110%. Entertain. That's that's number one. Of course, Elizabeth is having some uh, a sort of a bad premonition that something is going to happen, and Henry's trying to calm her down. And uh, Colin Clive is so good; you kind of get the idea that he's trying to convince himself as well really good to see Henry as a normal functioning person uh, in the second half of the film here. Even uh, Colin Clive's inflections are very similar to Claude Rains. I always wondered if maybe that was part of the reason he liked Claude Rains was because he was very similar to Colin Clive in his younger days. This started a, a trope that was classic for a little while um, before um, women kind of had their women's rights in movies where the woman would be told, oh, no, 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 you're safer here. Stay here. And the monster would always find a way to get into the exact place you told the woman to wait. As a matter of fact, something I've always respected greatly about the creature from the Black Lagoon is that in that movie, the female lead is told by the other men, you need to get get down below, get down below. You're going to be safer in there. And the male lead is like, no, she's safer here, right beside me. I got a gun in my hand. (laughs) And I always thought that was, that was quite cool that they, you know, they realized that trope was, oh, I dropped my pen. (laughs) 
uh, that they realized that trope was, you know, a little outdated and they had the, the, the guy go, no, 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 you're not going anywhere. You stay here. You're safer if you're with us so we can see you. Now, look at this here. This scene of the monster crawling in through the window and walking up behind the girl. This is another uh, reference, in a way, to uh, German Expressionism because it's a direct shot-by-shot recreation of when Caesar, the... <laughs> I always loved his little growl. <laughs> um, of when Caesar, uh, the zombie who is hypnotized, well, he's not like really a zombie, but he's a hypnotized man in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Uh, when he goes in through the lady's window and he is about to kill her, we see her laying in bed and he's walking in from the window, also unusually tall, unusually thin. And so it's, it's very creepy scene. Um, and clearly something James Whale took some inspiration from, uh, besides the fact that the sets are obviously based pretty heavily on the sets from that movie, we can see that is a shot-by-shot recreation of that moment. Now watch this. This is one of the most disturbing scenes in any older film, and it's still disturbing today, seeing the traumatized father walk through the streets with his dead daughter in his arms. That, oh my goodness, that is powerful. And this guy is such a good actor. I mean, really and truly, he's just phenomenal. But I did mention earlier, and this still goes, think about the fact that if you had removed her ultimate fate of being thrown in the water, you just see the monster move toward her, and then it cuts away. And now when we come back, the father is holding his limp, lifeless daughter in his arms. Up until you hear that she has drowned... The implication is far more disturbing than seeing the little girl just get thrown in the water because it's not like we see her struggle or anything like that. So to me, it always came across as far more disturbing what he could have done to that little girl uh, that would have been far worse than throwing her in water. And I always thought that was an element where the censors actually did the opposite of their intention. Rather than making the moment less scary for audiences, they made it worse. In our overly nitpicky culture, somebody would go, Oh, uh, how does the father know she was murdered? She wasn't there. She could have just fallen in. <laughs> Sin. Ding. No. Um, it's one of those things that for the plot to progress, you have to accept certain things. Okay? The father could have just felt in his grief that she was murdered. Okay? Um... The, the nitpickiness, it, it just is ridiculous. Um, plot holes are a completely different thing, by the way. A plot hole would be something that is a hole in the movie. It's a flaw in the movie. But just because information isn't given to the audience doesn't mean that information doesn't exist, doesn't mean there wasn't an explanation. So I've always hated that when people do that without taking the moment to think. You know, maybe, just maybe, they the director wanted you to do some brain work. You know? It's just, I mean, it's... They actually, I've seen people do the same thing with the movie Signs, which um, is a fantastic film, if you haven't seen it. Um, and it's been nitpicked to death as well. A lot of people say things like, for instance, oh... Uh, he asks for the family doctor to go and take care of their dog. Uh, well, that's that's a plot hole. No, it's not. It's not. If you watch the movie, it turns out later on the veterinarian in the town is the one that killed Graham's wife. So he doesn't want to take the dog to the veterinarian because he would have to take the dog to the man who killed his wife. But, you know, the people who do these sort of... These sort of comedic, quote-unquote, if, if you find it funny, videos on film, um, they don't really care about giving legit criticism about the film. They care about trying to make people laugh. And in their, in their desire to make people laugh, they forget that they have to be honest because they are um, damaging the careers of people who may not ever work again, you know, because of their 
ridiculous desire for affirmation from crowds of people who they don't know. <laughs> Whereas, you know, somebody who's a bit more of a film analyst would look at this and say, oh, maybe there's reasons for this. You know, maybe the father was actually, you know, nearby and saw what happened, but just couldn't get there in time. It's possible. I've heard people say, Citizen Kane, you know, there was nobody in the room with him when he said Rosebud, so nobody could have possibly known what his last words were. You know, it's a plot hole in the movie. But then you stop and think about some of the lines that say later, that are said later. later. Um, the butler actually says in Citizen Kane, I heard him say Rosebud one other time. So what is that implying? It implies that he was the one who heard him say Rosebud. Um, all I'm saying is, it's possible. You, you just have to do some brain work. Some of these things are not plot holes. Some of these things just require you to think a little bit about the situation. Um, and then other ones just require you to accept that in order to move the plot along, sometimes conveniences have to happen. Sometimes coincidences have to happen. Um, the greatest movies of all time do that because uh, when you're telling stories, it, there is a level of suspension of disbelief that has to be had. Um, and wanton cynicalness doesn't help anybody. It, it actually only makes things worse. Now, this is also the prototype of all angry mobs in movies from this time forward. Um, you might say that uh, the prototype was actually the angry mob in the 1925 Phantom of the Opera, but I view them less as the traditional, you know, torch-wielding angry mob, and more as a riot. You know, they don't really, they don't really seem as as much like um, an angry mob that goes out looking for blood. They feel more like a group of people that get riled up and they're going to destroy something or someone. <laughs> Uh, whereas an angry mob, it feels a little bit, a little bit more controlled. You know, they they have a goal in mind, and they all have the same goal in mind. So this is this is my my favorite uh, prototypical or archetypical angry mob setting. I just love it. They got the torches and the pitchforks. It's just grand. It's out for blood. Of course, Henry comes upon his creation, which he made with his own hands. And um, we see uh, he really can't put up much of a fight. I mean, obviously, could you? I, I couldn't. I love that the mob is also organized enough that they have the wherewithal to be quiet and listen when something happens. That's pretty good. Oh, there he goes again, Colin Clive, falling on the fire. <laughs> Pretty impressive. <laughs> he, he, he was just perfectly fine there. <laughs> Didn't even panic. Gosh, what a pro. Colin Clive was actually um, talked about for a long time um, as being more famous for his for his uh, alcoholism. Um, and he had a lot of pain in his life. Um, he was, he, you know, he was not a, um, he was not a black and white character himself. In fact, uh, another interesting thing about him is that uh, it, it was rumored, it was never confirmed, that uh, Colin Clive was a bisexual. Um, and so, although um, he and, and he and his wife actually were estranged for many years before his death, and um, he uh, could possibly have been, at least to a degree, involved with... Um, James Whale, they worked together on uh, a number of plays, from what I understand. Um, and Colin Clive, um, he suffered. He had chronic alcoholism. Um, and he ended up dying of, tuberculos uh, of tuberculosis. And he was only... Get ready for this. He was 37. Is that not tragic? He died of tuberculosis at 37. Man... That is just awful. I mean, look at what an amazing actor that he could have been. One of the great actors of all time. And it's just such a shame because um, a co-stars co co apparently said he napped a lot on set 
because he was so drunk and he very often had to be held upright by other people whenever it was a close-up shot. And now I do want to talk about this windmill because it's become such a powerful image. As you just saw, he threw Frankenstein off. Um, again, people might nitpick, oh, that's clearly a dummy. Well, yeah, we're not going to throw Colin Clive off of the roof. And if a stuntman did it, he would die. So yeah, we used a dummy. Sorry it upsets your sensibility that we didn't have CGI at the time. <laughs> this windmill and burning it down, I believe was actually at the suggestion of James Whale, um, or perhaps it was at the suggestion of, of Carl Emily, um, who thought that it needed to have a, a bigger climax, something really spectacular. Um, and we see Tim Burton pay tribute to this in his film Sleepy Hollow, which is another great and thoroughly underrated film, which pays tribute to the Universal mo Monster movies and the Hammer Horror films, if you're a fan of those. Um, now, this windmill was real, and they really burned it down. They built it and burned it down, from what I understand, for this film. Of course, Boris Karloff was not actually on or in it when it was burning down, but uh, it is kind of cool to see him interacting with these fire elements, and uh, also, it is very sad to see the monster coming to this kind of end, when he's so helpless and so hopeless. Um, it really is sad. I, I gotta be honest with you, although, um, you know, clearly he did a lot of bad stuff and sort of the frontier justice thing was very popular at this point in time. That's why the Phantom of the Opera from 1925 changed the ending from the original book to the ending with the angry rioters because, uh, they felt that justice needed to be, needed to be done on this villain for, for the, his evil acts. And I think this was kind of a holdover from that. I think at this point in time, people would have already been willing to accept the idea of the monster being the victim. Um, just like he was in the book, you know, the monster was a monster, but he was made a monster by his, the abandonment of his father. Um, you can read a lot into that symbolically, you know, psychologically, but of course a lot of people are torn on this. Henry's thrown off the windmill. He clearly died, but at the end, at the very last moment, they stick in this shot of Henry recovering in bed with Elizabeth. He's recovering. He's going to be okay. You know, some people say it's more fitting for Frankenstein to die with his own, by the hands of his own creation. If this was the only Frankenstein movie, I would agree. But Bride of Frankenstein is so fantastic that in hindsight, I think it's good. And I also think that Bride of Frankenstein and this Frankenstein movie ending with Henry surviving was the best choice for one other reason. Um, there are hardly any happy endings to any of the Universal Monster films. And once in a while, it is kind of nice to have a happy ending. It's sort of like in the 90s when it was very popular for these... It was very popular for these slasher movies to, to do... It, it, it was very popular for them to have, like, at the very end, oh, the monster's still alive, you know? And after Halloween, that became in, in, increasingly popular. But I do think that once in a while, you just need a happy ending, like in Lights Out, where the day is saved, the problem is solved, and the villain is dead. Good for the heroes, you know? All right, so that was my commentary on... Universal's 1931 classic Frankenstein, starring Boris Karloff and Colin Clive. Thank you for watching, everybody, and I'll see you in the next one.